Production funding for Behind the Headlines is made possible in part by... DHG is a full-service accounting firm serving Memphis and the Mid-South region for more than 60 years, combining community involvement with the technical resources of a national firm. For more information, visit dhgllp.com. The WKNO Production Fund, the WKNO Endowment Fund, and by viewers like you. Thank you. A look at the No More campaign and the effort to stop sexual assault tonight on Behind the Headlines. I'm Eric Barnes, publisher of the Memphis Daily News. Thanks for joining us. I'm joined tonight by Deborah Club from the Memphis Area Women's Council. Thanks for being here. Thank you. And Doug McGowan, coordinator of the Memphis Sexual Assault Task Force. Thanks for being here. Thank you. Also joining us, Bill Drees, senior reporter with the Memphis Daily News. And I should note that Megan Yevos, uh, a victim rights advocate and a rape survivor, will join us a little bit later in the show. So I'll start with you, Deborah. Just talk about what the No More campaign is. It's part of a national campaign, but it's also localized, clearly, um, and, and some of the things that are upcoming. The Memphis Says No More campaign is exactly, as you say, a localized version of the really powerful national campaign that began a while back uh, with a particular support from the Joyful Heart Foundation. The folks at the Joyful Heart Foundation have been advisors to us on our task force since we began the effort here to address our backlog. As we worked on um, moving those uh, stored kits to the lab, raising the money to do all that testing, and began to really look at what we were going to need in terms of investigating and prosecuting those cases, we also began to know that uh, we ought to think about prevention and awareness efforts around sexual assault as well. So we looked at the No More campaign. We found a tremendous local funder who helped us with some money that we could use. And we have created materials and a website. Our effort is aimed at um, equipping people, all of us, to know what to do when sexual assault happens. It also is, is uh, aimed at domestic violence. So all of these intimate partner kind of violence issues and uh, particularly the gender-based violence that's around rape and domestic violence are, are targeted by this campaign. And the messages in it really are aimed at making us think about what we think about these things even though we don't know it's how we think. So the messages are, are things like, no more boys will be boys, no more well she was drunk, a whole range of things like that that impact how we hear what victims have to say and how we respond to them. And our objective is to change that so that we respond with compassion and with help for, for, for people who've experienced these crimes. And, and how do you do a campaign like this that I don't think very many people, if any, would, would challenge the goals of the campaign or the themes that you just, you just articulated? But I'll turn to you, Doug. How do you, how do you tie that to tangible um, outcomes and, and, and deliverables and the kinds sure. of things that people go, hey, that's a great campaign, but it's just a, it's just a nice logo and it's just a nice poster. I mean, that skeptics might say about a campaign like this. How do you, how do you make it tangible as well as thematically important and in, in, in an important conversation? Well, it's a, the baseline function that we have done is to do some focus groups and to do some surveys so that we get a baseline awareness of, or some understanding of how people think about this today, what their attitudes are, what their thinking about this is, so that as the campaign rolls out, we'll be able to measure their change in attitudes. And uh, we think that the change in attitudes will ultimately result in a change in behavior. So we are tracking the data uh, from the information we found before the campaign was launched. And we will do this periodically over every six months to see if there is actually a change in perception about how people think about this. We'll also be tracking behaviors. Uh, we know that these are two underreported crimes, and so um, it may sound strange to say, but what we hope is that there is an uptick in people seeking service, both at the Family Safety Center, the Rape Crisis Center, because we know that people often think there isn't a resource there to help them, and we are hopeful that the No More campaign will cause people to seek to get service who are currently in need of service but are not reaching out for that today. And, and then that gets into, and, and you, you mentioned there that this came out of, in part, the, all the attention was put on the, the untested rape kits. And so can I ask you, I mean, where, where, where does that stand? Can we get some, because that's under, to some degree, I mean, I know that's being done by the police department and so on, but do you have statistics on the number of, of untested rape kits, sure. the, the backlog, as, a, as some people call it? 
Well, as the coordinator of the Sexual Assault Task Force, we're uh, obviously concerned with the number of kits that we have, and we're moving through those deliberately. But it's not just about the total number of kits. It's about being committed to reform in every way, shape, and form around the issue of sexual assault. So it's getting the unsubmitted kits tested. It's about the way that we investigate and prosecute. It's about being victim-centered in our interaction with our victims. Um, and so we also believe that, as Deborah said, it's incredibly important to begin doing prevention and awareness. Um, we report each and every month to city council, and we put a report on the city's website about how we're doing with the kits. Um, so today, just in general terms, uh, back in 2013, as you know, we had an inventory of about 12,000 kits. Some of those had been tested, others had been partially tested, and others had not been submitted at all. But where we stand today is that 5,000 of those have completed testing. In the last six months, we've sent another 2,000 kits off to laboratories where they are undergoing forensic analysis right now. And then we still have about another 5,000 kits that we still have left to ship to the, to the uh, private laboratories. And you've been testing. shipping around four or 500 a month, is that? It's give or between take? three to 500 a month uh, okay, that we so have been shipping. So another 10 to 15 months or something, 16 months, my quick math. So is that the kind of pace that, that we're on? You well, to, to get them shipped, we have to all remember that the uh, number of labs available to do this kind of work is limited and we are shipping everything we can to everybody we can contract with so their capacity to then finish the testing will will be the determiner for when this is really done in terms of the right. lab work. Right, and I guess that fits into a whole national thing of you yes. got a lot of cities. I mean this yes. was a, a policy which we've talked about before in the show but we'll talk about more if you want a policy that a lot of police departments had that they didn't test them. And so there is this, then this huge amount of awareness comes nationally and so these labs are a little bit overwhelmed. Is that part of the, the point here that the, the number of labs who can do it and there are a sure. lot of cities trying sure. to get these things sure. done? Sure, sure. We, we're, we're aware of several uh, other cities. Uh, some, some, a number of years ago, started uh, trying to deal with it, L.A. and Philadelphia and some others, and then, and then since... Uh, uh, since we started looking at ours, there have been several more, and, and we're, we're aware of many more that are coming. Yeah. I mean, along. Joyful Heart lists, I think I looked at their website this morning, at, you know, almost 150,000, but it's, there's a lot of vagaries because not everybody reports. There are a lot of question marks not, in some not, cities. Not so. everybody stores evidence the way that our right. department chose to do, and not everybody right. is choosing to right. approach it in this multi-agency way that we Which are. Which is, again, I bring it up not to say it's okay because everyone was doing it, but it is interesting. I mean, it's notable that it was part of a kind of national thing. Yeah. I would just like to mention that um, there is a very real decision point that communities have to make. What we have decided for our community is that we will test 100% of the kits that we have in our possession and 100% of the kits that we have collected going forward. And so yeah. it's our policy today that within 96 hours of collecting a, a kit, it will be sent to the forensic laboratory so for the, analysis. That is for the, going forward. The absolutely. New, going, sadly, since, the since, new since, kits. That's correct. So okay. since um, 2012, that has been our policy. Okay. Uh, for all the kits that we had in our inventory between, before 2013, we are testing 100% of those, whether they are uh, beyond the statute of limitations or not. And that is not the case for other cities. They are making a decision that is different than that for their community. I got you. Okay. And I think it's really important to remember in this conversation that women, especially women activists, have been demanding this kind of attention for many years. Um, We've, we've been asking police departments, we've been trying to get a higher percentage of rape cases prosecuted. And I'm not talking we, Memphis, but we, <laughs> the nation, maybe the world. I mean, it's, it's, rape is a horrific uh, crime, and, and there's been no question that um, police departments have needed to uh, change the way they listen to victims and the way they investigate these crimes how much uh, uh, energy they would put to them. So what we're seeing in Memphis is part of this finally a national wave of trying to do things in a, a newer and better way. All right, Bill. Uh, Bill. Yeah. Um, so, Doug, where, where do you think we are at the outset of this campaign in terms of our attitude toward uh, sexual violence, sexual assault, and domestic violence? So I wish I could give you the actual analysis, but we just received the surveys back and we just received the focus group information back and we're going through that now to find out um, exactly where we stand. Um, we'll have a better idea um, when we do the next round of surveys in about six months and the next round of focus groups in about six months. But today there is um, generally, uh, as you might expect, there are some attitudes uh, among some segments of uh, the people who have taken the survey that, um, you know, there is still some misperceptions about um, what the cause of the issues are, and, and there's still 
some in some segments some victim blaming about well why was she in that place and why was she engaging in that behavior and what we hope to push forward is the message that there really is no excuse uh, this is not victim blaming it's about the individual who was committing the crime they are the ones to blame for this mm -hmm. issue and so uh, we hope to shift some of those perceptions that uh, exist today and this has also involved training for the, the police officers who investigate these cases as well. Absolutely. So there is some uh, cutting edge science, uh, the neurobiology of sexual assault. Uh, Dr. Rebecca Campbell from Michigan State University is the leading practitioner of this science and it is groundbreaking. It has changed fundamentally the way that police think about interacting and prosecutors uh, think about interacting with victims. Um, where a victim's behavior may not have made sense, where her story may have changed over time. We understand now through the neurobiology of sexual assault that those are expected outcomes when you're talking to an individual because the way that their memories are laid down during this traumatic event. Um, the fight or flight scenario that we often hear about, well, what Dr. Campbell told us is that very often um, freeze, in fact, 52% of the time, individuals freeze in a traumatic situation. So uh, we've heard cases before where people talk about why didn't you just leave? Why didn't you fight back? Dr. Campbell has told us that we shouldn't actually expect people to do that because it's a rare case when people are able to fight back. So this is a, a new area, um, but most of the cities who are taking an aggressive stance here have trained their police and prosecutors in this new understanding of how brain science works in relation to trauma, which gives us a better ability to get outcomes in the end, a better ability to serve victims, a better ability to get better prosecutions uh, for each individual case. Right. We've, we've talked about this before in, in terms of where we are uh, with the fallout over the, the, the rape kits that were not tested, that, that piled up into what some people have called th this backlog. Um, uh, are, are there concerns that when you have the no more posters up, that you have some people who worked in the criminal justice system at the time that this was happening? Well, this, the faces that we chose to use uh, in this first phase of the campaign were selected because they are engaged in um, uh, addressing, changing, reforming our approach, uh, or they were survivors, faces and voices. Um, we looked for people who had a uh, connection to this work. And it seemed to make sense to us in this first phase to include the people who are helping lead the change. Yes, they, they may have uh, you know, been in their particular agency for a decade or two, during the time that, these, that the backlog happened, that doesn't mean that they were in any way connected to any policy decisions or, or practices uh, that were put down that anybody might think could have, could have led to this case and that case and that case being set aside. In any case, they are now, all of us, working together uh, to make these changes and, and try to raise the money and put together the government resources to make things different going forward. Um, that's about as much as we can say, I think, against that pushback. I think I would, I would just offer one other thing, and that's just generally, uh, as my mother always told me, when you know better, you do better. Um, we've seen this trend nationally, Eric, as you mentioned, there are some 400,000 untested kits across the nation. So this is not a Memphis anomaly. This is a national new understanding and a new learning with respect to this area. And so, um, many of the individuals involved were doing what they believed in their heart to be the very best uh, practice at the time and were doing what they thought was the right thing to do. We have a new understanding based on a lot of the information that's been given to us by Joyful Heart, by Dr. Campbell, and so we know better in some cases about how we can get better results. Um, and so the individuals here, you know, we, we hope that we continue to learn on this journey uh, of law enforcement about treating victims in the way that we expect them to be treated. And we, just a couple of minutes left in this segment. One thing that I know a criticism that, that, that Megan will have, you know, she's 
voiced elsewhere with the National No More campaign is that it's, it, you know, the NFL and some of these groups that are supporting it, they're supporting it somewhat cynically. That they're supporting it, that it's, it's you know, they have a bad history of, for, in case of NFL, of, of people, you know, all kinds of domestic, I mean, just terrors, you know, mm -hmm. horrible stuff. You know, why do you want to associate with the NFL when the NFL has this history of kind of whitewashing or, or brushing past this sort of thing? And again, criticism that some of the corporate support for No More Nationally is really a PR effort on their part. Well, uh, having worked in journalism for 25 years, having uh, been myself a, a cynic from time to time of campaigns, uh, I want to just say that Memphis Says No More is not about branding anything. I don't care if people learn what the button is. What I want them to do is go to the website, memphissaysnomore.com, and find resources to help people, whether it's their neighbor or their sister or their church right. friend. Um, we're, we're, not, we're not at all concerned here about the same things that generated Right. some part of the national campaign, which was to sort of have something that could rally people and it was identifiable and all that sort yeah. of thing. And as to the NFL, if we get some support from the Grizzlies or the Titans or others as we go forward, that will only be to the good because those players and those corporate organizations need to understand this and need to be part of the change. Let me let me get, I know there's much more we could talk about, but just to, in the interest of time, you have a, a, an event coming up at the U of M, obviously campus, sexual assault, date rape, all of that has been a huge national conversation. Talk real quickly about what's going on at U of M coming up September. Sorry, it's, it's, ahead, it's October 6. Okay, uh, sorry, October. It's, the date's been set uh, at the, hunt, it's called The Hunting Ground. It's a documentary about uh, campus sexual assault and we're partnering with the university uh, to help have an evening event that will actually be an invitation to all the campuses to send their students, their student leaders, uh, youth, youth uh, uh, professionals uh, to hear about what is going on with this problem and what consent really is and those okay. kinds of things. And then, in that, and then other cities are coming in just a we couple are. seconds left. So talk about October that 19th and 20th we're having a summit for cities so that we can learn from other cities and they can learn from us and so we're inviting 16 other okay. cities to come and engage in this. And the final point I would make about the No More campaign is that we ought to elevate the conversation and for me as a father of a teenage son and a teenage daughter what No More allows me to do is engage in a meaningful conversation with them, a conversation we may not have had quite frankly about sexual assault and domestic violence. Um, and it really is a catalyst for engaging a new conversation and bringing this and keeping it in, in front and center in our collective psyche. All right, we're gonna leave it there. Thank you. Stay with us, we'll be right back. joined now by Megan Ebos, a rape survivor and an advocate for victims' rights. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. And I should say, uh, you probably can't comment on this, but the only reason we're doing this in two parts, you have a lawsuit with the city pending, and so that creates some, some difficulties with, with the legalities of having you on at the same time is the only reason, um, it, involving a rape kit, your rape kit. But yes. let's, you've got concerns. Let's start with No More. We spent a lot of time in the first half of the show talking about No More. Um, you've got concerns and, and some criticisms of the campaign. Talk about those. Well, from my perspective as a rape victim, I think that Memphis should be doing three things in response to the over 12,000 untested rape kits. The first is investigate, the second is arrest, and the third is prosecute rapists. And I'm not seeing that that's being done adequately yet. And so that makes me wonder about no more. Right. Is it frustrating for you, I mean, that they, and, and the funding, I mean, the excuses uh, or the reasons or the justifications, whatever word you want to use, that it's taken so long to get, I mean, once the, the problem was identified and everyone came out and said, there's a problem, there are 12,000 untested kits, and yet it's still, they're only give or take half the way through. I mean, is that just to you, there's just a lack of credibility when they talk about anything because they're not taking that seriously? You know, rape kits are only part of the problem. We have, a, a, we have structural problems with how the police investigate rapes. And um, the, the testing of rape kits doesn't really address that. Um, if you test a rape kit all the way for DNA, you might have a DNA profile, but it's not going to do anything unless the case is prosecuted. So um, I don't think that we should just be focusing on the rape kits, but certainly um, the talk about finding private philanthropic funding for prosecuting rapists was discouraging. 
D discouraging that because you'd rather see the, sun, the city do it or the, the yes. government come up with that money that they rather than having to turn to a private person. Yes, it's a law enforcement function. Yeah, yeah. Bill. Um, and, and we've also talked, uh, I think when this first started, the term backlog was used pretty extensively and kind of came, became a way to, to term what this problem is. This is not a backlog in your view. No. No, to me, backlog refers to something that people wanted to address, but for whatever reason couldn't, even though they had tried. And that is just not the case in these cases where we see that uh, local law enforcement deliberately chose not to investigate fully, including testing for DNA. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the No More campaign, um, at, at, as we explored in, in the first part of the show, uh, the folks who are behind that campaign have, have talked about changing perceptions, changing attitudes towards sexual assault, domestic violence, and rape. Um, is that the place to begin in your view? Do you think the campaign can do that credibly? Well, once again, I think the only place that government can start is investigate, arrest, and prosecute rapists. And uh, this task of changing the public's attitude, I think, is pretty beyond the scope of our immediate crisis. Okay. And, and the crisis is to change the folks who are investigating this, change the way that they investigate it, their methods and their procedures. Yes. Yes. Are there cities that you'd point to that do it right? Yes, I would. Several cities around the country have implemented the Start by Believing campaign, which emphasizes the importance of the responding and investigating officers' conduct towards victims and questioning them and gathering information about the case. Um, in so many of these uninvestigated rape cases, we see the way that victims are interrogated and harassed and um, just given every reason not to want to cooperate and prosecute. And Start By Believing is, there's and a website, right? There I, I, is. Yeah. It is startbybelieving.org. And so cities that do that, that it, 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 what cities, have, did you name them that have? have I can't name them you can't, off the top of my head. That's okay. That's all right. Um, so the attitude part of it um, that they've, that, that, I mean, Doug McGowan was talking about um, is part of a national, take away No More for a second, take away the No More campaign. Over the last few years, there's much more discussion, it seems to me, about campus sexual assault. I mean, the, the Rolling Stone article being a horrible example, but it but was part of this kind of national conversation. Mm -hmm. All those national conversations, um, whether they're bundled up in a tidy kind of branded campaign like No More, is a positive development. It's certainly a different development, right? That we talk about this differently now than we did when I was in my 20s, you know, 20 years ago. Is that, I mean, do you like that? I mean, is that, that part of it is, is, is good? That part is appropriate? I think that the 12,000 victims who reported their rapes uh, already were familiar with how to talk about rape, and it was incumbent on the police to, to then uh, listen. Right. And, um, sure. you know, it, it looked like they didn't. So until we address that, I, I'm really uh, skeptical about no more's aims aside from that. Um, and also, I would like to say, I'm not coming on here to criticize No More. Um, I think it's great that some people in the community can um, join one another and talk about these issues, but I am concerned that if everyone in the community thinks that the problem has been solved, then no, that we will not actually fix the problems. And I think that campaigns like No More, although awareness is good, if they're not addressing the structural problems that led us here, um, they can actually be dangerous. Yeah, because it gives people a false sense of accomplishment. Yeah, a false sense of accomplishment and then a sense of complacency. Why do you want to make these reforms? We have No More. Right, right. Bill. Um, do you think that uh, we, we can have that kind of progress on this with the people who are currently in charge at the levers of the criminal justice system? I would assume so, because it's it, in Philadelphia, for example, 
there, in 1999, the Philadelphia Inquirer did extensive reporting on a serial rapist that had just really gone uninvestigated by the police there over years, and he ended up murdering someone. The victim's family sued. Reforms were implemented. The, um, the sex crimes unit of the Philadelphia police now does annual audits by outside women's groups um, to look at the success rate and the way that they're, they're actually investigating cases. Um, so I do think it's possible with the right accountability measures. All right. There's been a good deal of, of national uh, coverage of the No More campaign, which we pointed out is, is not a local campaign. It's, it's a national campaign. And in particular, the, the, the sponsors of it have, have raised some eyebrows as well. Um, has that kind of stoked your suspicions about the campaign? It did. You know, I wasn't very aware of No More until the NFL partnership, um, and that kind of splashed them all over the news because they did the Super Bowl ad. And I went and I was looking at their sponsors. They've got lots of corporate sponsors. Um, one of them, Jazz Pharmaceuticals, has a patent on a drug called Xyrem, which is the date rape drug, GHB. In 2007, Jazz Pharmaceuticals pled guilty um, to the United States Department of Justice for Ill an illegal misbranding scheme. And um, these, this company still has the patent on this drug. Um, so that means that any time you see GHB on the market, it came from Jazz Pharmaceuticals, and they are a sponsor of no more and um, just go ahead just a couple yeah, seconds left I'm sorry uh, just thinking about jazz pharmaceuticals NFL and Memphis what do we have in common no more and uh, public relations crises all right all right thank you for being here I thank appreciate you. it it's great to meet you we'll have you back sometime hopefully okay yeah. thank you thank you for joining us good night DHG is a full-service accounting firm serving Memphis and the Mid-South region for more than 60 years, combining community involvement with the technical resources of a national firm. For more information, visit dhgllp.com.